Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Mr. Ezaz Azhar. Hello, assalamu alaikum, everybody. A very, very good good morning to everybody coming today. Thank you all so much for making making this event. I know, I know it's uh, it's taking time out of your schedule, but I, I think uh, Prof Karim and the organizers of the event really, really appreciate you coming over here to, to listen to this fantastic speaker. So I, I think you guys give this a round of applause. Thank you so much. Oh, my clicker. So anyway, uh, my name is Izas, and I'm here to tell you a bit about my story. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a strange story. I think I've only got about 15 minutes before, before I start anyway. But the basis of it is I'm going to tell you that there's more than one path to learning. Thank you, Arif. It's more than one way to skin a cat. There are more than one way to, to get things done and to get into the system. And who am I? Oh, before this, what are our objectives today? There are three things that I, I think I'd like to, to take away from today's talk. The first thing is my learning path. It's, I think it's a very interesting story that, that you, you guys may, may find entertaining, amusing, and maybe depressing at certain points. I would like you to take, to take away some lessons that I've learned through my life and my business. And um, at the end of the day, what we really want, I think it's a quote from Tiga Abdul, but I think so it's a Malay, Malay, uh, you know, buang yang keruh, ambil yang jernih. There are certain things that you will like in this slide. There are certain things that you may not find relevant here in this slide. Whatever you find relevant, take it away. Whatever that you find is good, please keep it. So, a bit about myself. I'm not sure if you can see this, but I graduated from the Asia School of Business. It's a collaboration with MIT. I am a Bank Negara Scholar. I, I received a full scholarship award from uh, ASB. I am now a general manager of the Halal Development Corporation. Uh, I work under the Ministry of Economic Affairs. I think I'm one of the youngest top officers in, in a GLC nationwide. I still own and, and manage businesses. They're still running. I uh, run and founded a bunch of businesses from the media industry to data analytics. And I've, I've done a stint in investment banking. I've worked together with Bangkok Bank. I've worked together with uh, Procter & Gamble as a project. So by all Means, I, I think this looks like a decent CV, right? If, if I were to send this to someone, they would probably have a shot. Let, let's hear what this guy has to say. Now, the, for the truth, I think a lot of people here have master's degrees and postgraduate degrees, right? Is there anyone who studied up just until a diploma level? Wow. That means everybody here is all the way up, I suppose. Well, the truth is, I did not complete the schooling system. I'm a dropper. I dropped out of form two. I don't even have a PMR. As far as they're concerned, the highest education I have is the UPSR, right? I somehow survived for 13 years in business. I somehow managed to enroll at, at MIT and go with MIT. I somehow got into a top position at GLC. I've played in bars and played for functions for 80 ringgit a night, among other gigs. And if you were to see me 10 years ago, I look like this. So that, that's an actual picture of me dragging stuff that I bought from China. So the question on everybody's mind is, doesn't make sense. How the heck did all this happen, right? So, welcome to my story. So where it all began, I, I come from a fairly unorthodox family. We do things very, very differently in my family, you know. I just came home one day and I said, you know, Dad, school isn't, isn't working for me. I don't like what, what they're doing. And Dad said, why, why don't you like school? And I said, you know, I'm not learning what I want to be. I see you talking to your managers. I see you talking to uh, your staff. I see letters that you write, the tonality that you use, the phrases that you use. I see how you manage conflict. I see how you put stakeholders together and make something, create something of value. I want to be that guy. And dad, being the maverick that he is, he said, okay lah, be so that, be so lah. And that was it. I actually left. I didn't sign any letter, just disappeared the next day. <laughs> so what I did over the, over the next couple of years, I pretty much shadowed him. You know, I saw how he did his business. I saw how he ran things. So I, you could say that I learned a lot from my experience. That does not mean that I was uneducated in that sense. Maybe academically, yes. But as far as experiential learning was concerned, I think I, I really got the ropes from my dad. So the thing is, people learn differently, right? The reason why the school system is still around until today, it's lasted 10, 15,000 years, is because it works, right? That's why we still have schools. That's why I have universities. They work. And testament to that is the people coming out from USM today, you know? We have great people coming out. And it's a working system, but it does not work for all. There will be outliers. If you were to draw a normal distribution curve, I would be all in the way on the right-hand side. Some, I don't know how many sigmas out there. But people learn differently. And 
the first lesson I got out of this, was it a risk to leave the schooling system? Of course it was. Everything in life, everything that we do is risk. Me speaking here right now, trying to sell you this idea, is a risk. You might not like it. You coming here today is also a risk. You might have said, you know, this guy is full of BS. It's a waste of my time, right? It's a risk. But what we really want to learn is how to manage risk and not to fear risk. Because when you forfeit risk, you forfeit the reward. Everything in life is a risk. Get used to it. Learn how to manage it. Don't fear that. This was my first lesson when I left everything. Moving on, a bit of some entrepreneurship adventures. So in 2005, I started a, a jamming studio, and I did it together with, with another the guy crazy enough to support the idea. It was a passion-driven thing, you know. I said, hey, man, let's put together a jamming studio. So said, yeah, let's do it. And I was like, let's, let's charge people 20 ringgit an hour for it. He said, yeah, man, let's do it. And that, that's what happened. It, it's a crazy sort of thing, my first business venture. I put a total investment of 4,000 ringgit in the thing, you know. And I had to wire my own lights, I installed my own doors. I, I picked up all these egg cartons and looked up for some proving. And I remember we didn't have furniture. So I went to the junkyard in the middle of the night, the jungle balik already. We took all the furniture, we repainted and used it back. That, that was how desperate or I, I don't know. That was something we did for survival, for the survival of the business. And here's another picture of me with, with my staff, you know. And it was really a wild goose chase at the end of the day because I became, I turned that small studio into one of the largest import and exporters of music instruments in Malaysia. I turned it into a massive place. And how I did that is I went on a wild goose chase. Once again, a risk. I took a very big risk. I went to China. This was free Alibaba. I had no idea what was there. You know, I just went to one street and I started talking to shops because the customer wanted 700 violins from me. So where do you get 700 violins? No one has 700 violins, right? So a friend said, hey man, go to China. There's a lot of, lot of producers there. So I, off I went. And I had a big hardball negotiation with the Chinese suppliers. When you deal with China for the first time, free, night free, Alibaba, there is no deposit. There is no upfront. It's everything, 100% all at once. So I went there, I saw the goods, you know. I said, okay, these, these violins are kind of decent. And I talked to the Chinese guys and they said, you know, you want 700? Can give you full payment. So I had to make a call to the office. They said, hey guys, can you wire 150,000 ringgit to this random Swift account? And then my boys were like, hey, are you sure or not? <laughs> I said, yes, just, just, just do it. So that was how I got my first big break. And where am I today? It, it became a pretty, pretty success, I would say, you know. I've got people like Kim Siti Hasma who came over to the studio. I've come to the point of even organizing events for, for Dr. Mahade. That's me sitting in the center. I don't know how I made it there, but in my just I don't know why I was there anyway. But music has taken me into so many places. I've played for Obama. I've played for you guys. I've played for all, all sorts of people, and I owe it all to music. And here's the thing. You see the successes. You see me on stage. You see the pictures. By the end of the day, what really mattered most is what I did when people were looking. And this applies to everybody. Whether you're in university, whether you're in an exam, whether you're an athlete trying to fight for a gold medal, we see the gold medal. You know, We see maybe bits and pieces of, of the media, but behind it all, I'm out there every day working my butt off. You know, No one sees that part. And that's the most important part of it, what you do behind closed doors. And that's where the, the true success really lies. That's another lesson I picked up. So moving forward, I enrolled myself to, uh, to MIT, to the Asian School of Business, as one of the unconventional students, you know. I, I remember the first interview coming into, into uh, the university and, and the, I think it was the admissions department, they said, Isas, why the hell do you want to do this? You are so far, they, they really whacked me down, you know, you're so far detached from academia, you've never been, literally, you don't have a PMR, you don't know what a calculus is, you know, you are going to struggle so hard why do you want to do this? And I gave them one answer. I said, I want to prove it can be done. So I, I think they, they took that answer quite seriously when I come back to Dato Asma and talking about how you judge a person's character. Right? They said, okay, we accept the challenge. And so what I had to do to pass the entrance exam, I had to study calculus, statistics, I had to study finance from scratch, basically. Imagine this guy who's really, really bad at algebra, right? I'm studying for all this stuff. And I, somehow I passed it. Right? Somehow I passed it. And then another hurdle came in the sense where I was stopped by the Malaysian government because they wouldn't allow me to, to enter, enter the university. So 
I, I owe a lot of people big time, and one of them is definitely Dr. Osma. Thank you so much for, for your kindness, the kindness that you've shown me. And I hope I prove you right. I hope I prove you right this time. You know? And I passed the MKA test. You know, I passed the MKA test. And that was just the beginning of it. I had to struggle hard to fight against the selection of international students over the world. There only 30% of us were Malaysian. I think about 47 plus 47 people. We had about 10 Malaysians, 12 Americans. And these were guys who qualified for Stanford. These were guys who qualified to go to uh, places like MIT, you know? And all of a sudden, you got this school dropout trying to compete against them. Well, that's, that's, that's hard, but I struggle. And somehow or other, we want, we want to know about grades. Yes, I, I did graduate with a 3.49 second upper. It's not that bad, you know? <laughs> I think, <laughs> considering where I came from, I don't think it was that bad. But the grades aside, this was where, where I went to. So I went to MIT, uh, the MIT Sloan School of Management. But how did I get there, right? The question is, what, what did I do to plan myself there? And this is another very, very important statement. You got to sell yourself, right? Because if you don't do, no one will do it for you. If you're not out there promoting yourself, not, not that I said promoting yourself, there's a very, very fine line between giving yourself credit for what you've done and arrogance. Don't cross that line. There's a way to do it, right? But if you don't sell yourself, you could be the world's best graduate. You could be a Nobel Prize winner. You could be the guy who's gonna, gonna come in and change the country. But if I don't know about it, then what, where do you go from there? Right? So if you don't sell yourself the way I sold it to MIT, I said, I want to prove it can be done. Here, take that, guys. And they say, yeah, okay. So if you don't do it, no one else will. And this is a very, very important lesson that I learned along the way as well. So moving forward after MIT, what have I got left? I joined the workforce. So my businesses are still running, so I decided to say what it's like in, in the working environment. And that's a picture of me, once again, trying to sell something to Vincent Tan. I don't know if you guys can see it. It was a mobile app of sorts. This was taken maybe in 2011, you know. The deal didn't go through, but I tried. The point is I tried, you know. The point is I tried, and I tried hard, and I put myself out there. So I, I joined the workforce for the first time in my life. I've never worked at a job before, right? This is my first job, my first ever interview. I interviewed with uh, the Halal Development Corporation. It's, you know, it's under the Ministry of Economic Affairs. So it just so happened that my skill set, right? a particular role that they were looking for. It's a role in the, in the special projects division where it's, it's really a mix of, I would say, investment banking to decide what to invest in and what makes money, and uh, management consulting to improve processes, to improve efficiency. Basically, I'm in charge of everything from finances to doing the website. Lah. Yeah, that, that's what I do. And my first job, somehow I got promoted to general manager, right? I mean, what, what is this about? That doesn't make sense again. But it was a direct application of what I learned throughout my experience. If it wasn't for all the experience that I went through all this time, I would not be able to do this job by now. Coming back to experiential learning, coming back to giving people a second chances, coming back to, to developing talent. We have talent in Malaysia that's developing under our noses. We don't know them, we don't see them, but they're learning through YouTube, they're learning through a Facebook, they're learning through Scribe.com, Coursera, they're learning through Khan Academy. And one day, these guys are going to come knocking on our door, right? They will come to universities, they will come to institutions to knock on our door. Are we prepared to receive them? Are we prepared to manage them? Because if we don't, they will pack up and they will leave. So I, I think that's something we really have to think about reimagining what education is like, you know? And I especially uh, agree with uh, Professor Asma, Dr. Asma, who, who really, I think she gave a very, very powerful talk on how we should cast a bigger net for inclusion. I mean, 4,000 students and you've got 400,000 people with the SPM. And here's the thing, the interesting thing is people who went through this, this experiential learning process, right? leave school, get out, run a business. The guys I know who did that, I refer to them as Tansri. Those are tycoons, right? And so certainly there's something we could learn from them. So back, back to my, my uh, uh, path to joining the workforce, right? This would have not been possible with all the kind people who have helped me throughout my life, right? You'll see some, some faces, some familiar and some unfamiliar faces. And these are people who helped me push things through, who, who were there for me when I needed them. And this is my next point. Emotional capital is everything. A lot of people, if you may have may or may not have heard about emotional capital, Google it. When people ask me, Isas, 
how did you get to where you are now? Right? How did, how did you manage to do all this stuff? And I, I, I think to myself, was I smart? I don't think so. I think there a lot of guys, in, even in this room, are much way smarter than I am. I don't, I don't think I expect to say that. Was I talented? I don't think so either. I've seen what talent looks like, man. I know what they look like. They're on YouTube. That's talent. I'm just, just another, another imposter, a hack of sorts, you know? Was I hardworking? That one, maybe I can claim a bit of credit for it. There was a big struggle for it. I can claim a bit of credit. But if I were to define why I'm here today, if I were to sum it up in one word, it was kindness. By the grace of God, I was kind to many people in the past. I've gone above and beyond my responsibilities to these acts of kindness. And somehow they remembered me today. And when I, when I asked, asked for assistance, they were more willing to help me. Right? So never underestimate emotional capital. Start building it. Start building it now. Start building it with your friends, with your lecturers, with your students. It's very, very important. So I'm going to end this very, very quickly, right? A lesson that I learned at MIT, this was scribbled on a wall, a small, tiny wall somewhere that many people ignored, but I saw it. And this is what it is. An idea that at first does not sound absurd has no place in the future. I'll give one example. This guy, this guy right here, you know, come from a school dropout, mana boleh masuk master's degree. That was my idea, that was my dream. It was absurd then, but it's not now. The phone that you're using right now, you know, communicating halfway across the world is something that you touch that turns uh, digital, digital uh, media into something that you can visualize. That, that was a crazy idea. That's the future. So this was, this was taught to us at MIT. And finally, I'm going to wrap it up with something. I've gone on and on about, about relationships, about building capital, about understanding people. Here are my final thoughts, and these are the values that I live by. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. That's the truth. Forgive them anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. For in the end, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. And these were thoughts by Mother Teresa in a, in a poem anyway. So, thank you so much for listening. That's all I've got to share. If you want to get in touch with me, you can uh, write, write. I've got a legit MIT email. Yay. So, let's talk. And thank you so much for coming. Assalamualaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to Mr. Azaz Azhar.